Hello, devoted YouTube followers. I am Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And on today's WebDM, we continue our role-playing class series in an effort to redeem the reputation of paladins from the ancient conquest of lawful stupid's past. So let's break into it. <laughs> Let's get divine with this just a tad. Okay, Let's talk okay. about paladins. Paladins have a special place in D&D. The holy sure. warrior, the champion. Yeah. And they're generally connected with a vestige of what some see as a bygone era. Sure. Like the lawful good paladin, doing everything that is good and right. Is good and, and right. How does that, what does that look like from a, a role-playing perspective? The, the classic lawful good paladin, we mentioned this in our, our rundown of sort of the class mechanics of, the, of it uh, in our last uh, class series, that I like the classic lawful good knight in shining armor archetype. Of mm -hmm. the Paladin, and I think it still has a place in Dungeons and Dragons Fifth mm -hmm. Edition. There's all these newfangled evil Paladins and Oathbreakers, Oathbreakers and Conquest Paladins, and the like. You know, having those options available is is interesting and makes for a, a richer game. But classic, like I've I've sworn an oath to uphold truth and justice, and the and way. yes, the American way, you get that, like that picture of Colbert with the eagle and. Um, the Colbert Paladin. Mm -hmm. You can have that kind of character without being the stick in the mud. Uh, I'm going to make everybody in the party do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. A lot of that was tied into older editions. Um, the requirements for being a Paladin meant that you not only you had to obey certain strictures, but the people you knew. Mm -hmm. You couldn't associate with them if they were thieves and, yeah. and robbers and murderers and liars and things like yeah. that. It couldn't be the difficult. Yeah, you couldn't be an accessory after the fact. Yeah, it made it difficult to, to spend time and to adventure with those sorts of people, and so it created this conflict between the Paladin players, and let's be honest, Paladins in older editions of Dungeons & Dragons got a ton of special abilities. More yeah. so than, than and, you know their other warrior counterparts and so it was often drawn to people who wanted access to those special powers because they wanted a power game or they thought it would help them win at Dungeons and Dragons and then they sort of used the restrictions on alignment that the Paladin has as a bludgeon for their other players yeah. and you know that's a classic case of the Dungeon Master needing to step in and clarify things and make sure that uh, one player isn't ruining it for someone else. But, yeah, you don't want a power gamer to become a Brita. Right. <laughs> You just don't. It's just a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so instead, what you've you've got a legacy, and there are people who don't like paladins because of that legacy. They see them as lawful stupid, or they don't like the the strong religious connotations that come with uh, with the paladin. In some ways, the paladin feels more fanatical and more religious than a cleric. In some ways, you know, their their connection yeah. to the divine seems more immediate and more uh, intimate. Yeah, they're ready to take up arms and defend what they believe, like, right now. Right now. And they're really good at it. I, I think that those kinds of things mean that there are some DMs out there and some players who are just like, yeah, we don't like paladins at all. But the classic archetype, the lawful good, whether, and I think both redemption and uh, devotion uh, oaths are good for portraying that uh, that classic paladin archetype, mm -hmm. and so like if, in in looking at that, my my favorite version of that archetype is Michael from from Dresden, Michael Carpenter from Dresden. Perfect, right? I know that I've mentioned this before because every time I talk about paladins, I talk about how that character in the Dresden Files exemplifies the paladin ideal for me, mm -hmm. and that is a character that trucks with a sorcerer with infernal connections, uh -huh. or, or sorry, a wizard with infernal connections because if he was a sorcerer they then you know he would have been infernal killed. connections and he kind of becomes a warlock eventually so dresden himself is not exactly um dresden's means and methods are not exactly paladin-esque but dresden's goals are the trick to playing a character who is virtuous and upstanding and is sort of the shining example of everyone else is not using that as a way to make other players and other characters mm -hmm. worse off. Yeah, exactly. Be an example. Be, right. the, be the representation of. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to lecture. Right. Serve as an exam a living example of those ideals in which you embody and you surround yourself with people who, while their methods might not be something that you uh, endorse or that you want to participate in, their goals 
are. Mm -hmm. And you can have a situation where you get very legalistic players who are like, oh, every time we need to lie, we're just going to, the paladins, we're going to find a way to contrive for the paladin to not be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that works sometimes. Yeah. But if you are the player of one of those paladins, then you might be asking yourself, why does my party always ask me to leave when they're about to go talk to the quest giver? Right. Because the paladin also can make a good face. The charisma is one of their abilities that, that they want to have. And so if you don't otherwise have a party face or a social character, the paladin can often make do in a pinch. And there is a place for the vir you know the virtuous, upstanding, I, I live by the ideals that I that I uh, that I hold to type character, mm -hmm. I find those characters very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's easy to compromise your ideals. It's easy to look at something and say like, yeah, my character believes in these things, but when the chips are down and I need to accomplish a goal, I'm going to be very mercenary, very pragmatic in that approach. Yeah. But having a, a player, or sorry, having a character who's like, yeah, this is going to make my life more difficult. I'm going to have a tougher time defeating my enemies. I'm going to have a tougher time accomplishing my goals because of these tenets that I hold to. Uh, and, and, and that's interesting mm -hmm. because that means that you're not taking the easy way out. You are telling yourself and, and, and making a stand and saying like, all right, I'm going to hold justice and truth and I'm going to try to be honest and forthright and merciful and just. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of situations in Dungeons and Dragons where that's difficult and it, it's just easier to be kind of a, a rat bastard and a liar and uh, self-serving because it just makes tackling whatever obstacle in front of you is easier. Oh yeah, always, yeah. always. It's, it's much harder to hold on to your ideals and, and your own personal goals. Right. Uh, and using that segue. Yeah. Lining your personal goals with the party or if, you know, if it can be aligned. Uh, let's move into goals. Yeah. Xanathar's Guide's kind of four ribbon ability things here where you got personal goal, you have symbol, your nemesis, and your temptation. Yes. So right? they, this is really good. The the, the role-playing kind of uh, tips that they're giving you in Xanathar's for, for paladins, I, I find particularly interesting. The personal goal can either complement or transcend your oaths. So when you're looking at those oaths for your paladin, that all the tenets of those oaths are your guidelines, your sort of overall big picture purpose uh, that your character is going to have. But they you can look at say either each one of the tenets of of the oath or just all of them overall and say like okay is my character's personal goal their personal quest is it tied up with these goals is it or is it complementary to them uh or, you know my, my accomplishing my goal will further the tenets of my oath or vice versa or is it something different and your personal goal is is very personal and maybe it conflicts with the oath mm -hmm. and maybe there is tension and 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 difficulty there and you have something that your character wants perhaps it's uh, unrequited love or or a person that they want in their life that they know that if that person's in their life they will be unable to uphold those uh, those tenets or uh, right yeah. yeah someone uh who has that un unrequited love and takes the the an oath just to be like, I need to get this person out of my head, so I'm gonna go swear a vow of celibacy and right. all this, because I need to forget <laughs> that. But it's still there. It's still there, and, and the tension is still there, and maybe that character comes back, uh, maybe that NPC comes back and, and serves a, a useful function as a nemesis, or a tempter or something. But the personal goal is, is could be a quest that you're on. The knight errant, the questing knight, oh, yeah. is a good archetype for the paladin because they've, they've got this drive that keeps them going. They've got a, they've got a quest that they need to accomplish or a, a, an oath of loyalty or fealty to someone that they need to fulfill. And those archetypes fit well with a, a warrior who's driven, devoted, has strong convictions, or wants to be a, a force for something in their campaign world, whether it's a force for good or a force for, uh, in the case of, say, an Oathbreaker or Conquest, more oppressive, uh, evil-type goals. You yeah. know, it, obviously, it's one of those things where you, you come up with it and, and you give it to your DM and you say, I don't know when this is going to come up, I don't know how it is, but I want you to take this piece of my character and yeah. do something with it. Add, add this to the soup that you're making. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm working for there. this, I want to do this, yeah. and let's figure out some way to get there. Right, right, right. Um, so moving on, uh, let's, what, what about the, what about the symbology? Sure. The symbol is one of those, I, I try to like, 
think about these uh, these uh, role playing hooks that they're giving you in Xanathar's is like, what does this signify for the world that you're playing in? And I see it as like the paladin is a beacon, an example, an exemplar of something, mm-hmm. and a, a symbol that they have might uh, be representative of that. Whether it's uh, an animal that's associated with a certain virtue or a mystical beast that's associated with some kind of uh, ideal that the paladin's trying to uphold. But you got to think about it. If you're in a typical D and D world, then perhaps the great great mass of people don't read. They don't know who you are. Uh, and so symbols and symbology and 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 the like become very important. Your heraldic device, the symbol that you bear, says something about you. They might not know who you are as a person, mm-hmm. but the symbol that you bear might tell them something about you. I'm here to help. Yeah. I'm a trustworthy individual. You can, you can confide in me. You can uh, come to me for advice and assistance and I will be there. You know, the, the dungeon master can play around that. Perhaps that reputation gets tarnished. Uh, perhaps someone is stealing your symbol and, and using it to mask Raid is you, and you have to, to solve that uh, that problem. Mm-hmm. Or people are mistrustful because others who bear similar symbols are, are not as trustworthy yeah. as your character is. That's kind of something that's worth thinking about, uh, specifically for the paladin, because they are these exemplars and virtuous examples. Right. Like. Yeah. I mean, if you're the type of uh, paladin, like probably either like vengeance or like conquest, and you roll into town with like your symbol is an eagle with like bloody claws. Yeah. And that sends a message pretty quick. Maybe the symbol is more like a, a Batman type situation where the bat is a symbol for the superstition of criminals and it was a very 1920s thought as well. well you know, like, but the, it, I criminals mean, are a cowardly and superstitious lot. Uh, I would say definitely that Batman is a vengeance paladin. Uh, he certainly fits the mold. Vengeance paladin monk. Sure, yeah. yeah. You can definitely see that. This certainly fits the mold of the Vengeance Paladin uh, in spirit. Looking at that table in the chart, I, I was less inspired by that than I am by the next two, the Nemesis and the Temptation. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, when you're a Paladin, obviously you're going to have like an Arch Nemesis. Sure. Uh, nemesis. Nemesis. <laughs> Plural. I, I can't not make that joke you anytime I see that you word. Can't not make. I don't even remember what the rest of that movie was about, other than them arguing over nemeses. Uh, Waffle shit. Man. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm pissed off that we didn't make a Mr. Furious reference in the Barbarian yeah, show. Yeah, Dane I mean, that's Cook. a perfect. <laughs> there you I'm go. about role playing. Anyway, uh, your nemeses. Your nemesis. Your nemesis. You're, you're out there trying to do the good work, and yep. there's always going to be those. That want to tear you down. A rival of uh, someone. You yeah. presumptuous, pompous, yeah, self righteous. How dare you, you think know. you can tell the rest of us what to do? Kind exactly. Of the big question here is this a nemesis that you acquired pre or post oath? Yeah. Is this someone who remembers you as you were before you oh, took your holy vows? That ratty kid that, mm-hmm. that, that, that picked on everyone. Yeah, and they're just there to remind you and, and uh, you know, you're not you're nothing. You know, mm-hmm. I know where you came from. I was there. We grew up together kind of yeah. situation. You are not this holier than thou exemplar of a virtue kind of mm-hmm. kind of character. The other way is sort of like, is this a, a, a nemesis that you, doesn't matter, you might not know them personally, they might not have done anything to you personally, but the, in a, taking your oath, they are now your nemesis. I accepted the vow of, the ho- of my holy orders and now the deceiver is my nemesis and mm-hmm. the deceiver is out there and they and they are an adversary of my order yeah and so i will fight them however i can is your nemesis even aware that they are your nemesis yeah it could very well be that you are like yeah I, this this person's got to go or this creature has to go or this thing has to go and i cannot rest until uh, you know un- until it's gone and this other creature or thing or person is just like doing their thing yeah, had no idea that they are, uh, you know, have are in the sights of a paladin until until your paladin <laughs> shows up and gives their flowery speech about righting the wrongs of the uh-huh. world. It's like, oh wait, you're talking to me? You're talking to me? And, and <laughs> you could do interesting things with this. It could be that the act of confronting your nemesis is what causes them to go down the path of villainy. That is the whole reason why you were out to stop them in the first place. Kind of like paradox, pa- sort of a uh, creating a paradoxical <laughs> evil. Uh, I like doing things like that just because I, I like those sorts of situations. The big thing for me is like the nemesis should or could be an obstacle for the personal goal. 
that the paladin is seeking to accomplish or could or should be someone who stands opposed to some of the oaths that um, or the tenets of the oaths that yeah. they uh, that they that they have and it could be that the nemesis is also tied in to the paladin's temptation right perhaps the nemesis isn't someone who's out to stop or thwart the paladin but to make them fall yeah, to corrupt them. To corrupt them. There's a reason that succubi and incubi and glabrazu and arcanaloths and all those sorts, of, they're mostly fiends, but there are some sort of fae who, who, who are in the same vein. The, you read the monster descriptions. They're over there talking about tempting mortals, night hags are another one. Oh, yeah. They're not, those aren't just abstract nebulous mortals that the monster manual is talking about. The monster manual is talking about your characters yeah. in your party that you're DMing for. Yeah, they're not there to just tempt some people that are out there in the game world. It's no like, why isn't there a succubus for every paladin that just exists to tempt them into wickedness? Yeah, and tempt them to break their oath. Oh, every time an oath is is sworn, a succubus is born in a way of hell. Like, <laughs> That's a good. Like you yeah. gave me life. You gave and me I'm life going to give you back. First off, the temptation uh, as a whole is it tied to your character's flaw? Mm -hmm. in any way is it one of those things that's connected to a tenant of your oath that you struggle with or have difficulty with part of the reason why you want a temptation for your paladin is because of the of the tendency for paladins to become holier than thou yeah. and to take on this kind of flawless i'm an exemplar of virtue and and righteousness they're still flawed they're still mortal yeah. And they should still have foibles and failings and, and, and things that they, they want to improve. Mm -hmm. And is it connected to their flaw that you chose from their background? Or, or is it uh, somehow connected to an oath? Yeah. And how is the tempter, the person or entity or thing that's there to do the temptation or to, to entice, mm -hmm. going to use that? Um, it should be something that's irresistible. And, and you either trust that the player will act on that irresistibility and act on that temptation but it could very well be that you entice and tempt the player with in-game rewards like yeah you know <laughs> there's a, a lot of ways you could do that if yeah. you have a player you know they all they love and want are is that one magical sword or magical a certain item type or of magical yeah. item yeah and you throw that in there and then you just put right out in front of it an action that go, runs completely contrary to every oath they swore yeah but all they gotta do is this one thing you just gotta do this one and thing it is you have the grasp. power yeah so here's a scenario that i've i've wanted to try out and i i've, I've not really had a lot of I haven't done it specifically this way, is that there's a tempter in uh, in the party. Let's call them uh, an Arcanaloth or something, because an Arcanaloth has a lot of spells that they can use, a lot of resources that they can have, and, and you might never know that they are a fiend in any right. way. You might just, they, maybe they appear to you in the guise of your mother or a mm -hmm. loved one or something that causes you to then question every time you see that other person whether or not is it the fiend yeah. Or is it the real person? And you're sort of like breeding this uh, mistrust and uncertainty in the player. That tempter works behind the scenes or through agents or minions to frustrate the paladin in their goals, to set obstacles in their path, to make life difficult so that when they come to the paladin, they have the solution to the obstacles that the tempter themselves set up. And they go, all you have to do is come to me. All you have to do is give in. All you have to do is do this one little thing, say this one prayer, perform this one ritual, swear your service to me, something, and I will give you what you want. You want to save those people, you want to stop this evil, you want to see these things brought forth in the world, you want to be the light that you want, we can give you that. Mm -hmm. We will give you the tools to have that, but you belong to me. And that creates a tension, right? There's a goal, there's oaths, there's things that the paladin wants and that the character wants for that paladin. And the tempter is saying, you can have those goals, but the way to get there is through me. Yeah. And especially if you have one where they are deliberately making it more difficult behind the scenes in order to frustrate the player or the character and be like, well, I just, you know, everywhere I turn, there's enemies around and I mm -hmm. just can't do it. And lo and behold, your tempter has the perfect key 
that will make everything easier. Yeah, and of course your tempter is the one that's sending all those enemies to of you. Of course they are. putting the pressure on you and yeah. forcing you into the position of, of dire circumstance. Yeah. That will make you turn away from your oath and to them. Yeah, a lot of those sorts of moments are pure role-playing, and they don't even have to involve any mechanics or enticements of mechanics and magic items and spell effects and titles mm -hmm. and things like that. It can just be one of those things that you work your way into the campaign and 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 try to trip up the paladin that way. Yeah, and because all they want to do really is to sever that connection between the paladin's god or the religious organization, right, which leads right. us to the to the next point. What does that connection look like? Is yeah. the paladin part of a lone righteous warrior where they brought up in a church? I mean, yeah. like, is there a connection at all needs to be established? What yeah. connection if any does the paladin have to the religious organizations that you're creating for your world as well as the gods that that animated and and, and received worship from your uh, from the the setting? Is the paladin a religious figure in your world and mm -hmm. and that's the dungeon master uh you know creating the setting and sort of saying like this is the place of paladins here's where they fit in but it's also the player themselves saying like well do i want my character to be part of an official organized religion at all uh, and there are some paladins where it doesn't really make a lot of sense an oath of ancients paladin doesn't really suggest a big organization you might have something like the old faith in greyhawk where like the druids have an official religion mm -hmm. that they perform and has ceremonies and the like and there may be an oath of ancients paladin there like guards a sacred grove or, mm -hmm. or, a, or a standing stone or, or an enchanted pool or something like that or you could go the more classical route where it's like here is a hierarchical church organization with an authority figure at the top and deacons and bishops and cardinals and priests and temple guardians who are fighters with acolyte or or paladins themselves and do the paladins fit into that rigid hierarchy are they a part of that uh or are paladins seen as divinely inspired and blessed individuals who the church works to bring in and works to woo and to say hey we would love for you to come over here and be a part of our organization yeah. but they have to accept the fact that their deities have blessed certain individuals outside of official church sanction Mm -hmm. And that creates tension because there are going to be people inside that organization who are resentful of the power and influence that a paladin might wield, who want to see those things curbed, who want to bring them in under the heel of authority that the religious organization represents. And now you've got tension. You've got conflict. The paladin might be an outsider, might be someone who's seen as a maverick or a radical, uh, someone whose uh, actions in the world, while good for the world are bad for the religion that dominates that area. You yeah, know? yeah, they're out there writing checks that their god can't cash. Right. Because you, know? right. <laughs> uh, you can't have that. You can't have that. And then that just brings us to, like, are they are they even divinely inspired in the first place? Like, they, they, they are divine class, right? They draw their energy through divinity and through a connection to those entities in the Dungeons & Dragons world. But... Over the years, those connections between the divine and the character classes that are that that represent them, mostly cleric and paladin, those bonds have been frayed as the conceptual space for clerics and paladins grows larger right. in the hobby. And it's possible now to say things like, well, yeah, my character, my paladin is not a religious paladin. They don't uh, worship gods. They might not even believe in gods. Maybe they're a, a, an oath of the crown where their oath is to civilization and law and the throne and the authority represented by a temporal figure. Yeah, in uh, our Vigilante game, um, the paladin in our, in our group, Sigurd, he was an atheist. He was a dwarven atheist who who loved the storm and the, the divine, or just... Like, like in nature, you can you can find the divine in anything. It uh -huh. doesn't have to be a cosmic force or yeah. you know, anything like that. Yeah, and that's that's what he did. Is his, his was a, a a vengeance paladin. Yeah, it was the vengeance of the storm. Gotcha. That 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 can wreck anything. And that was <laughs> it was kind of you know it was an interesting take on it. I, I actually really enjoyed that. Yeah, I, I I like those kind of takes too. I like the challenge of a classic paladin. And the most recent paladin I played in in Curse of Strahd was. Devotion, lawful good, they are a knight in shining armor. Now I went different. There's a half orc with the haunted one background. That was perfect. So that there there is some sort of like darkness in their past that they're trying to overcome. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed the challenge of trying to be lawful good and not just adhere in to Barovia. My, in Barovia. <laughs> and not just in, adhere to my tenants, the tenets of my faith. Um, but also to the principles of, of law and goodness. 
and to play a hero who's like, yeah, I, I really can't trust any of these people. Any one of them could be an agent of Strahd, but they are not, most of them are not willing agents. Most of the people here have had to live their lives under a brutal, evil regime. And my paladin had compassion for those people. Yeah. That, that his response was not, these people need to burn because they're evil. It's what terrible circumstances they live under that they have to resort to these measures to survive. Mm -hmm. And, and when you think about a D&D world and all of the evil and pain and suffering that must exist in it because of the monsters in the Monster Manual, because of the, the fact that there are evil gods and wicked forces in the world that seek to do others harm and make their lives miserable, that there's got to be people in the D&D world that just do whatever they can to survive. Mm -hmm. And a paladin comes along and says, you don't need to do just that. You can hold yourself to a higher ideal. You can hold yourself to a higher virtue. Yeah. And compassion for the people who are unable to achieve that is one option. You can go the route of just like, oh, you can't live up to my standards, then you're less than nothing. But that's the bad archetype of the paladin. That's the paladin that got everybody a bad name. And to move to our next little section here is, uh -huh. is maintaining that oath. Right. The oath is central to the paladin. Yeah. Right. It is It is what gives them their power now. Right. And you break that and you lose. you could lose your power or shift into another version right so that's you're raising two two really good points with that and yeah. that the dungeon master needs to decide when they know that they have a paladin player what does it mean for the oath to be broken yeah can we track a point at which an oath is broken and then after that is atonement possible or what are the options for a paladin who has broken their oath yeah and so are you going to be like hard line strict like you lied that one time you know that one time and mm -hmm. that's enough for you to, you know, get on your gods or deities or cosmic force that you represent or for the oath that you swore and the magic that it imparts on you to be broken, you need to atone for something. Mm -hmm. A spell like ceremony is a good is a good one for that, which paladins and clerics have access to. And that can be sort of like a minor atonement type effect. It's easy enough to add like another thing that that, that spell does. But I like that particular spell because ceremony is a world building type spell. Yeah. It's not one that you're going to be casting every day, but it's one that if you think of the life of a priest or a cleric or a paladin, a ceremony type spell they're going to be using all the time because it fulfills a lot of different purposes. Oh, yeah. So maybe yeah. that's one route where, where you go with that. Yeah, people coming for confession and you cast the ceremony of atonement. Yeah, sure, the ceremony of atonement yeah. for that. Or you or you know, there's other type of and you can go outside of the spell casting system entirely mm -hmm. and have atonement be tied to a quest or a vow or something. Maybe it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, you have the, the tenets of your oath that you have to fulfill, and when they're broken, there are additional vows that yeah. you have to labor under and fulfill before you're back in the good graces yeah. of whatever entity it is that grants you your power. Yeah. Maybe they're vows of, of, of poverty or vows of charity or chastity mm -hmm. or something. Uh, look after a certain place for a while or to uh, slay a certain enemy that you might otherwise not have any connection to. To seek atonement, you have to show your trust and faith in your God. So go and destroy this enemy but you cannot wear any armor. You must yeah. she you must read yourself in, faith. in the faith and the <laughs> right. armor of your god. Yeah. And trust that it will make get you through. Yeah. That is one where you're 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 having to take that setback in order to prove mm -hmm. uh, a, a certain change of heart. Yeah. As it were. So you go from that 18 AC because now you're like, 10 decks and you got a shield and you cast shield of faith and now you got a 14 yeah, maybe. you got a 14 yeah. and you got to got to uh, just deal with that looking at the oaths and yeah. looking at the the individual tenets of the oaths are are a good a good starting point for figuring out who your paladin is yeah. really absorb those because there's no longer the alignment restrictions gone uh, certain oaths lend themselves towards certain alignments mm -hmm. but they don't have to be you you can imagine situations where i mean it's kind of hard to imagine a good aligned conquest paladin. It's really hard. It's really difficult given the whole crush at, crush hope and yeah. douse the <laughs> douse the flame or whatever douse the fires of hope right. or whatever it is. Uh, I mean, I, I personally am playing a conquest paladin in Shaw McGovern's game. We're going through the Tomb of Annihilation, uh -huh. but I'm playing uh, Yanti Pureblood. 
Right. So <laughs> a bit different. It's a little bit different, <laughs> and it's actually kind of perfect. I mean, he's right. neutral evil. Yeah. Uh, all he wants to see is the rise of the the Yanti Empire, like uh-huh. all of them. And Dindar eat the sun. And, and want Dindar to eat the sun and everything. He's got his own personal thing. He's got a his love is is currently dying, mm-hmm. and so he knows what happens, and that's why he's questing to destroy this thing. I haven't really brought that out in play yet <laughs> right. because they don't really share their feels because. Because technically, not? they're not supposed to have feels. Sure, sure. Uh, but, <laughs> but I mean, I, I think I role play him quite well. As, yeah. It's just this, he's kind of an asshole, and he's like, no, we need to go destroy that, you yeah. wuss. You know, yeah. like, no, we're going to... Well, you, you can do that. You can be that kind of, like, pressure on the party where it's just like, no, we need to confront this thing. We need to deal with it. We need mm-hmm. to do this. We cannot dawdle. We can't... Mm-hmm. We can't, you know, waste time or procrastinate. This is the thing we need to do. We need to do it with overwhelming force. Mm-hmm. Crush our enemies. See them driven before <laughs> see us. See them driven before you. Hear the lamentations of their women. Right, and we need to be strong enough to do that uh, on our own. And I can see a, a Paladin of Conquest kind of like pushing for that and, mm-hmm. and kind of um, that just force for aggression and domination in a in a party that's you know probably a little morally gray already, yeah. or at the very least is willing to tolerate someone in there who's very aggressive and domination minded, mm-hmm. uh, if not outright like trying to seize control of the group. It really is one of those where I mean, it, conquest and redemption, the two options that are in Xanathar's, are they ask a lot of the group that this paladin's a part of. Yes. And they ask the dungeon master and the player of that paladin to to work together with the other players to make sure that everything kind of works nicely together. Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, is I see the conquest paladin as uh, as a reaction to the, oh, it's Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, now we can't yeah. do anything. Well, guess sure. what, murder hobos? <laughs> now you can have a paladin in the party. Yeah, now you got your paladin in the party. And uh, then nobody gives a shit because it's like, okay, cool, let's just destroy everything. Right, it's a different enough flavor from the, the Oathbreaker. Um, yeah. You know, there's a special place for an Oathbreaker, Necromancer, Death Priest, which we've done. Uh, and <laughs> a lot of neat synergy there, both conceptually and mechanically. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other paladins as well, like uh, Crown is one where... You don't, you know, that lends itself more towards the lawful alignments. Yeah, uh, yeah. Obviously, one of the tenets of it is law, and loyalty, courage, and responsibility to the others. But, you know, that's one of those where, you know, as long as the party's not a bunch of lawbreakers, yeah, it, then the paladin really does not care what they're up to. Yeah, they're they're mostly capital L, lowercase g, lawful good. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. The the goodness is a as a happy byproduct of adherence to the law and, and yeah. to a, a deference to authority. Yeah, good people are are there because they follow the law. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And and you can see that uh, an oath of the crown is being sort of like an inquisitor type, someone who <laughs> roots out corruption or 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 yeah. her- not heresy is is maybe not what we're going for here. We're talking about like enemy of the state mm-hmm. or enemies of the throne uh, that's where the, the crown paladin uh, uh, really does well um, but they, they also share some conceptual space with devotion mm-hmm. and, and some of the more traditional paladin types well yeah like you went through devotion you got you know you have to have honesty and courtesy or uh, excuse me courage and compassion mm-hmm. you know those those more like typical honor and duty yeah and, and, and as long as you embody all of these things you can be a good person which i mean yes you can i don't right. to sound flippant when i say that. right 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 missing. yeah but it's one of but those those tenets right there honesty courage compassion honor and duty they are that's a different kind of game and and I think it's more it's it's more exemplified in in, in redemption when you really look at the tenets of that. But if yeah. you're really treating your opponents with honesty, if you're really treating them with honor and duty, then then you need to be prepared to take prisoners. Mm-hmm. You need to be prepared to try diplomacy before violence. Mm-hmm. You need to be prepared to uh, show mercy and compassion towards people you have power over. Yeah, and it's ask it, it it asks a lot. It says like step up, play a character who is not just kick down the door, kill everything, uh-huh. and 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 let someone else sort it out. Yeah, there's someone who this these sorts of paladins are ones that say like I'm going to um, attempt to be merciful in a world full of merciless monsters. Yeah, and I'm going to attempt to be honest in a world where deception is rampant and, and there are creatures always out there to deceive and, and being honest is almost kind of a, a hindrance in some Well, in yeah, some I mean, and te- te- 
typically you're 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 going to want to eschew uh, more like uh, the obfuscation or subterfuge in order to get something done. You want to yeah. go right up to the enemy and be like, "I'm here to do this, and I want to give you a chance to to turn yourself in." Right, right, and maybe that's how you approach a lot of it. Is like we are here to 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 take you in, or we are here to stop you. Mm -hmm. This is your chance to end this without bloodshed. Yeah. And of course, when there's not, they are still, paladins are still warriors. Even the redemption paladin. They still smite. They're still a warrior, <laughs> yeah. right? And they've learned how to fight somewhere. They have the proficiencies in, in, in armor and weapons that give them the tools they needed to, to be combatants. They got the D10 hit die. They are warriors through and through. But even looking at something like the redemption, peace, innocence, patience, and wisdom. Yeah. There's not a lot there that suggests traditional adventurer. No. And, and when you read those tenets, it's, it, you're dealing with someone who looks at an orc and a, or a drow or something and goes, that is an innocent being who has been corrupted by something, by either the society they live in, the gods that they worship. Yeah. There is something that has happened to that, to that creature, that, that person, that was uh, innocence that's been lost. And the redemption paladin says, uh, I, I'm going to attempt to tap back into that somehow. If that fails, I have the wisdom to know when violence is necessary mm -hmm. and the wisdom to know when ending a life is truly the only course of action. It's, yeah. it's there. It, the, they're not pacifists in the, in, in the extreme sense, but they are ones that attempt diplomacy first and violence is a last resort. Yes. That's very different than the typical Dungeons and Dragons adventuring structure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, like, like Thor learned from Odin, a good paladin never seeks out a, a, a conflict, but is always ready for. But it. is always ready for one, and and when and and the defense of innocence, right? Like it's one of those things. There are creatures out there that are so far beyond redemption that the only option is to prevent the harm that they will do to others. Yeah, and violence might be necessary for that. And the redemption paladin is on hand and there to protect people who are innocent, and there to offer a chance to change their ways to an enemy who might have never known that they had the option to do something different. Mm -hmm. They might have never encountered someone who said, I don't want to fight you, I want you to be better. Yeah. Uh, and those that's the kind of moral nuance and gray area that you can introduce into Dungeons and Dragons through an oath like redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a couple of ideas specifically for the redemption oath. I, I really think an atheist redemption paladin is is in the cards because I look at this and I go, all right, so this paladin over here is like everyone's born innocent and we they deserve a chance and 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 you should offer them mercy and 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 justice. Then it's really all these gods. Yeah, and, that and make their machinations. and their machinations and their petty squabbles with each other that drag all of these people like a big net up into their corruption and up into their wickedness and mm -hmm. evilness, and the the drow are, are Wolf has if she was out of the way if the drow pantheon was gotten rid of then what effect would that have on the drow? Mm -hmm. If Grumpsh and Kirtlemach and Maljubliet and all the other orc and goblin and kobold deities are out of the way, and those people are allowed a seat at the table, They're, they are brought into the fold of civilization, what kind of world is that? And maybe you have a paladin that goes, yeah, you should stop worshiping the gods. They do nothing but harm. Yeah. And you should instead follow the, the philosophy that we are all uh, a, a one people. We are all creatures that exist on this world and mm -hmm. have to cooperate. Yeah, That's what, a kind of paladin I could give up. Yeah, mind. and once you get that out of the way, then you are accountable for your own you actions. You are now accountable now. for your own actions. And if you fail, there will be consequences. Yeah. But it's worthwhile to attempt that redemption. Yeah. Uh, I think the other one I'm kind of thinking of is like a reformed villain or a reincarnated villain who's now redemption. Mm. And maybe they don't have the option of being anything other than, or maybe they genuinely are like, yeah, I used to be a vicious, murderous monster, and something happened when I died, and I was not allowed to die, and I've been brought back and filled with holy light, and I see the truth now, and I want to do, and I want to atone for what it is that I've done, and yeah. that's that's where you jumping off point for the redemption paladin. Yeah. I really like it. I think it's one of those where people might look at it. I mean, mechanically is one thing. Thematically, I feel it holds a lot of power to it. Yeah. And and there's a lot of good stuff there that you can mine.
Um, oh, oh, most definitely, and uh, and ancients, right? A- ancients is a, is like the most friend adventurer friendly one I see, and right. it doesn't hurt that their that their oath aura of like having spell damage is really handy. <laughs> um, nothing but wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. They also have a really good bonus spell list. Mm-hmm. Um, but the oath of the ancients is one where it's about. I think that's really the one where it's about being an example to others. Yeah, it's all about the light and light. Yeah. This very nebulous term that they're using, but I take the light to mean hope, oh, yes. and inspiration, and and a sense of of non judgmental goodness. Mm-hmm. Because chaotic good, chaotic good can be just as judgmental as lawful good, right? Right. But it's a a sense of of non judgmental goodness that says, "You do you. I am going to be me, and yeah. be true to myself, and foster the light and hope in the world." Yeah. And I would encourage you to join me. But I don't make any demands on you mm-hmm. because it needs to be your choice to shelter the light within you, to foster it in others and yourself, and to be a beacon for others. That's what yeah. the Oath of Ancients represents. Yeah, you are there. the candle in the darkness. You are the candle in the darkness that that burns bright and offers hope to others who mm-hmm. whose candles might have gone out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which which leads us to the last one, which is the vengeance, and their candle almost went out. Their candle almost they went have out. This ember of of, of, it's of burning of, hot of, ember, burning hot <laughs> ember that that powers them and pushes them towards their goal, right? Right, and I the vengeance one is I yeah I imagine it's very popular because the mechanics of it are are quite powerful. They're awesome, and, and you know the the vengeance paladin brings the pain. Yeah, but even there, like the. The, the tenant, uh, you know, fight the greater evil, uh, no mercy for the wicked by any means necessary, and, and restitution. The by any means necessary has me, that's the one I hang my, I, I, I hang a concept on. The greater good? The, because it's like, there's this greater good, but it's like, not even my own qualms yeah. should get in the way. Right. And it suggests uh, someone who's taken an oath that they themselves are not sure they're on board with yet. Mm-hmm. But they're willing to to obey the tenets of that oath, even if it's like, yeah, I, ooh, this seems pretty bad. And and this is the situation where it's like, yeah, the hag has to be stopped. And it doesn't matter who that hag has charmed. It doesn't matter who that hag has brought under its spell and corrupted and what, you know, mm-hmm. or, she needs to be stopped. That or baby switched. Stopped. Or a baby switched or something. Mm-hmm. That monster needs to be stopped. The greater good is that that night hag should not be in the world. Mm-hmm. And if it takes some innocence dying along the way, then we will atone for that and seek restitution after the fact. Yeah. But it is the taking down of the greater evil. Yeah. It is the focusing on the real threat and this makes me. There's a lot of like paladin themed parties. I'd I think of like there's one I, I really want to run where it's like the devotion paladin, a war cleric, a fighter with the acolyte background, and a zealot barbarian go to hell and wage holy war <laughs> against the denis the infernal denizens of the hellish realms. You know that that's a campaign I could get behind. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, <laughs> I, w- I want to play that. I would probably do the fighter with the acolyte background. I'd do a human. Uh huh. First level feat would be magic initiate. Okay. Yeah. And you do. What do you think? Shield of faith or. Protection? I like I like protection from good and evil yeah. for for that just because there's a lot of fear and charm being immune to those disadvantage for a lot hit. of different baddies. Yeah. Yeah. But then you know with your cantrips you. you <laughs> Take a couple of just, <laughs> just good, good cantrips to, to back that up. Just whatever, whatever guidance. you want to. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Get into mechanics. This is role play. Um, <laughs> oh, but I the other one that. is, but the other one is having two separate paladins in the same party. Yeah. And and having the particularly like, let's say you've got a vengeance and a redemption paladin yeah. in the same party, and they're going to come to, at, to odds with each other. They are going to be like, no, this is not, this is not right. But if you have them with the same goal. If their end point is the same, then there is a way for those competing and seemingly irreconcilable oaths to exist alongside one another. Yeah. And the, the the redemption paladin is there that says uh, we should seek mercy in what we do. We should seek temperance, and we should seek to bring people back mm-hmm. uh, into the in into the light and mm-hmm. redeem them. And then the vengeance paladin is there to. Re- remind everyone here is our real enemy 
Yeah. The real enemy uh, isn't the small potatoes people. It's the demon lord that that is seeking to return. It's the evil lich that has reawoken from its long somnescence of, you know, and it's back in the world seeking to experiment with some nasty spell that it's devised over the last 500 years or something like that. And those are the kinds of things that the Vengeance Paladin can can stay focused on where the Redemption Paladin is there to say there will be broken people along the way as we seek this greater evil. And those broken people need to be healed and are deserve yeah. mercy but this supernaturally evil thing over here must be fought so there aren't more broken so people. there's aren't there's not more broken people could spreading their wickedness and, and and just like living their lives of pain that then spread further evils throughout the land um that's all of that is wrapped up in the paladin and those sorts of stories and those sorts of situations are are great fodder for dungeon masters and players who are looking for those moments they should be looking to the tenets of their oaths and going like, okay, in this situation, what is, what is, what do I do here? They should be their touchstone. That's why you're playing a paladin. The smites, all that business, whether you're some monstrosity of a fighter, sorcerer, paladin, warlock mm -hmm. over here with a dip into assassin, yeah, you know, thing, you know. whatever your Richard <laughs> Cheese paladin, right? Is, is, <laughs> right. I, you, know. you know, paladin gets dipped into because of the smites oh yeah and there's a lot of people out there who are like they love the mechanics of it um but i think that the role-playing possibilities of it make make for a very rich experience and and they should be the touchstone for people who really want to play a paladin those oaths are what you that that should be your guiding principle yeah in those situations and we've done 47 minutes and we didn't even talk about no, oath breakers yeah that's fine but i think we conquered that yeah there's oath breakers <laughs> <laughs> they broke it anyway Humanoid PC games, such as players wanting to be or... Oh, okay. Well, Jim, you want to go ahead and take this? <laughs> I mean, I I think <laughs> that's I think that's probably fine. Given, the, like, if you're not if you if you're changing up the lore behind them, like, I can't imagine with like the standard lore for something like a Lithids that you could find a place for an Lithid in an adventuring party long term. Like at best, you're like, yeah, you can guest star as an Lithid for a few sessions. Yeah. But then we're gonna have to find a different character for you. In theory, I don't mind monstrous PCs. I think they're, I think they're, you know, they 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 work if it's. I, I don't know. Let me back up. Like if you're if you're if you're saying like I'm gonna make a character that's a monster, then you've already accepted that things are gonna be a little bit unbalanced and a little bit wacky, mm -hmm. and you should just go all in and not like oh, but we got to make sure everything's nice and. But this option is balanced against that. No, just go. One of you guys be a storm giant, and the other guys be a beholder, and whatever you know. I, yeah. If that's the kind of thing you want to do, there is that doc somebody put up on DM Skilled, I think that they took every monster in the monster manual and like made a race out of them that that you could choose. Oh, um, that's probably where that I would up. start because you know I don't like doing a lot of work. Yeah. Well, but. I mean, going to our out of abyss, out of the abyss game. Audie played a vampire. She played a vampire. You did. A, mm -hmm. I thought you did a great job of of breaking up the vampire abilities and their their feats that she could take at certain levels. So right, you kind of right, right. Grow into it. I don't see why you couldn't do that with most monsters. Like even in a lithid. Yeah. You're a young lithid. You haven't really refined your powers. You only got two tentacles. You only got two tentacles. Uh, right. Of course, nobody in the party would ever let you stay on watch by yourself. No. Like no, no, no. no. You you rest. Thing is like, you rest. I, I, we got it. Most of the <laughs> most of the challenges I see with like monstrous PCs are not mechanical. They're thematic and and sort of narrative. Yeah. Or just like you're really gonna have to work hard to justify why this lithid is out on the surface, uh, out in the sunlight, where they're gonna be all dried out and shit. Yeah. And not eating everyone's brain. Yeah. Right. Like let's, and so those are the kinds of things where I'm like, I, you know, unless you're radically altering the, the lore behind the monsters, it can be difficult to justify just, you know. Yeah. But in theory, I have no problem with it. Right. You, I mean, you're literally running a game where everybody's playing monstrous races. Yeah. It just sounds like a fun game. Yeah.